Double Denial by A. Kevin Quinn, 1950. You go in by the main gate. There's no turning back, so you go in. The order said, proceed to Dachau. Upon its surrender, establish order. So you go in. At the time, you would rather go back to the line and rush a hundred bayonets. You'll wish before long that you did so. That you never passed the black and white striped sentry post that opened onto Concentration Slaughter Dachau. Establish order. The colonel who wrote that couldn't have sensed its irony. How do you establish what others have tried so cunningly to eradicate and with years to do it? Did the colonel know that the whole point of Dachau was that men must be destroyed by chaos? Did he know that the password was nothingness and the countersign perversion? No. Like you, he knew nothing. That was why he could sit in his staff car and dictate innocent words, and why you can accept them with such gravity. Oh yes, the main gate. But before you get to the main gate of Dachau, you have to cross a small bridge. Near it, a single-track railway goes toward the stockade, to be lost within the green-gray masonry walls. Suppose you cross the bridge and head to the gate, but your way is blocked by a long train of freight and cattle cars. You can crawl under them or go over them. You climb over them. They tell you later that the people had been in that train for 27 days. That long. When people go that long without food, will they eat one another? If you go over the tops of these cars and look down into them, can you tell who's still alive? Can you even tell which legs belong to which body? How, if they're all heaped together like broken, dirty dolls, like a basket of half-dead crabs, gray and slimy, twitching only now and then till you wonder if you saw anything move at all? And more important, if that arm moves, does it belong with that this man's head? Or is it a woman? They're all naked. Can't you tell? On to the main gate. Establish order. Pass those bodies on the gravel bed beside the tracks. How do they get out? Trying to run? But can you run on sticks for legs, all bones and no muscle? Mm. There's the answer. A rifle bullet in each head. Very little blood, strangely. Move on. Others are coming up to take care of this. They're the people from further back who will stand in front of the cars and have their pictures taken. At the main gate, there is no sentry. There is a soldier from the 45th loading his tommy gun carefully. Just inside the gate, two men on the ground, dead. They are dressed in striped clothing, a coat and pants like pajamas, like some of the people in the cattle cars. But these are freshly dead, and there's a lot of blood. One has his face cocked over one's shoulder, as if he's listening. He has a double chin, a delicatessen store face. He's too fat. These guys tried to fool me and run out dressed like a prisoner. The soldier released the bolt of the tommy gun, and a new round clacked into the bridge. Ain't they pretty? They are. Nicely, cleanly, freshly dead. Not emaciated, dry, and bony. It isn't hard to find the camp headquarters. It sits there, the Verwandtenstelle, right in the middle of a large clearing. Walk in an excited daze, but keep to the sides. Don't cross the clearing. The noise never stops. You can still hear the tommy gun at the gate. You wonder whom the guard has caught now. He seemed a bit too calm. Uncanny, but you think he's out of his head. So are the others. As you pass a doorway, a hand reaching out taps your shoulder. Jump quick and swing the forty-five around. But it's only a prisoner. Short, dark, Semitic-faced, bright-eyed, and young-old. Sir, I welcome you. I speak English. You're surprised. This is an un-American, un-Western, un-human place. You expect Greek, Russia, Slovak, and Chinese. You expect Babel. But you don't expect English, so you gape at him. Sir, I am a good interpreter. Do you need, I know this place, to be your guide, public relations man. Take me with you. I know everything. And he winked. You ask his name. Ali Kuchi. Worked for a newspaper in Constantinople. He's an Armenian. You say, Armenians here? Who else is there in this hell? He spreads his hands, palms up, turns his eyes upward. Who is not? Americans, Poles, Russians, Dutch, Norwegians, French, Arabs, everybody. I show you. How many? 34,000. 20, 25 different nationalities. I will come with you. Might as well. You're lost anyhow. He leads you to the Vavantenstelle SS. Across the clearing, the prisoners race back and forth, looking into one another's faces, looking for friends, looking for enemies, looking for fat German bodies in dirty prison dress. When they find one of these, and they do find some, they tear them apart. They sink nailed claws into the cheeks. They rip the flesh, put out the eyes. They pound the face into gravel. They jump on them. Somebody should put a stop to that. Otherwise, the war crimes team will have nobody to interrogate. There are engineer troops in the administration building, looking for booby traps so they won't let you in. So you stand with Coochie in the doorway. You wonder where Anderson and Taggart are. They're captains, damn it. They ought to earn their pay, too. Your luck to be just a Louie. So you get the dirty jobs. This is one of them. Coochie keeps talking excitedly as you stand in the doorway. You're not listening. A group of prisoners comes by, marching in a loose formation. Suddenly, when they see you, they stop. 
Frenchman, Coochie says. You know some French. You talk to them. You say, what? How do you address people like these? You walk out to them. When they see you coming, they take off their hats. The dirty berets and bandanas. They look at you as if you're holy. Uh, bonjour, mes amis. Je suis American. Ah, oh, American, they burst out excitedly. American, il parle du français. Un officer, marvelu. One fellow cries out a question, but the French is too rapid. Another and another tries to get your attention. One fellow is crying. More shouts, questions, but a big fellow turns around and quiets them. Let monsieur le colonel speak. They stop suddenly, crestfallen. <laughs> That's funny. He thinks you're a colonel. Hell, if you were, you wouldn't be here. The big fellow turns around to you, and he bows his head as he speaks to you, like a monk inclining his head toward the altar. Something of importance, Mon Colonel. We wish to report that the SS have only this morning killed our leader, Monsieur La Evique. It is a great crime. We are sure all the Americans wish to avenge it. He waits expectantly. You look at Cucci. Uh, La Evique, that means bishop, doesn't it, Cucci? Oh, yes, yes, bishop. The SS killed the bishop early today. You want to see? A minute later, you're looking at the body of a man who was kicked to death. You see a crushed and swollen head half buried in the pile of shavings in the carpenter shop. A head made for a mitre, the body of a bishop, half naked, tight skin over pitiful bones. In concentration slogger Dachau, even shepherds must work for their bread. So the SS have made him a carpenter. Today, they beat his brains out with their boots. A heavy wood plane is embedded in the skull. A prisoner guards the body. He has tied two sticks of wood together like a cross and put it in the purpled fingers. The big Frenchman points to the guard, then says to you, That is a priest of the bishop's own diocese. He will watch the body. We want all the Americans to see. You nod dumbly and go out. The administration building is cleared now. There are no booby traps. Inside the door, you meet Taggart looking very businesslike. You go looking for the commandant's office. It's on the second floor. A luxurious room done in expensive wood paneling. The furniture is covered in heavy green leather. Tonight you'll sleep in some comfort, Taggart says. The desk is terrific. At least eight feet long. Pictures of the Bavarian Alps are on the wall. A flashy SS sword stands in the corner. Kuchi grunts and grabs it and examines it carefully. It's his sword! The Commandant's. But the Commandant, where is he? Nowhere? Anywhere? Maybe lying in a mess of spaghetti brains near the main gate? Maybe in Munich? Maybe in hell? That magnificent radio phonograph combination near their desk. He must have been quite a music lover. There's a record on the turntable. Dramatically, you wonder what music that gorilla listened to before the staff car took him off to Munich or Berchtesgaden. A good guess would be Ride of the Valkyries or Gotterdammerin. Well, turn it on. The set is on and the disc begins to spin. Taggart, looking through the drawers of the desk, jumps as the soft voice of a woman sings, Ali Voglin sin schon da, Ali Voglin Ali, am schild drosel fink und star, an die granze filthy hyena. You'd recognize that tune anywhere, in any country. A nursery rhyme, a cradle song. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. It's some hours later and you're tired. Tired from seeing and hearing too much. Taggart is still around, lounging in the commandant's office, listening to records. Maybe he's too afraid to come out. And you don't know where Anderson is, wise old codger. He's not so dumb keeping away. There's a hell of a racket out in the hall. Running out, you see a strange little scene. A group of guys in OD forming a ring in which an old man and a young boy face each other. On the kid's face, there is only hate. He's choking with it. Half crying. And he points out the shaking finger at the old guy. That's him! That's him! Yes, but who is he then? He stands a man of 55 with close steely gray hair and a steel trap of a mouth. Someone's been working him over. Cut lip and purple bruises on the cheekbones. He's wearing the bottom part of a prisoner's rig. His chest is bare with burning welts and gouges in the flesh. He holds his pants up with one hand, the other hand rigid at his side. He stands erect, military. The kid keeps saying, yeah, that's him, that's him, he's the one. One of the guys in khaki is from the war crimes team. He has a Jewish face and speaks good German. He glares at the old man, then speaks to him. You are the adjutant of this camp? Yeah, yeah, the kid keeps saying as he bounces up and down on one leg. That's him. I saw him in the crowd. He's the one. He seems still terrified of the old man, mortally. The old fellow's lips curl. Jewish swine. Long nose, long tongue. He spits and is rocked back by a fist. It is not your fist, though you felt your shoulders move. The man's head cracks against the wall, but he comes erect again. You can see in his eyes what he thinks of the kid. The kid is still nodding his head. You could see the teeth and spit between them coming out on his lip. So they take the man in the old room for interrogation, as the war crimes fellow calls it. 
the room they pick on is the one you've settled on for your office. There is something on the old man's face that you can't forget. You see it even on the blank wall. Something that can't seem to die. A hardness. You think of it more when they've been the questioning. For 14 days, you will live next to that room and hear the question, then the blow, a cry, and now the question shed it two at a time. They use their fists or, later on, a GI belt with the buckle still fastened. In the next 14 days, you will see him in the hall, going under guard to the bathroom, one step slowly after the other, groaning with every move. They'll make him clean the bathroom out with his hands, then back to the room. Why or how to stop it, you don't know. But he has something, the old man, that tells you he will never break down under the beatings. The war is over, and his world is dead. There's little to hang on to, only tight lips. The questioners will try a lot of things to force them open. How many did you kill here? Where are the records? The Commandant! Who gave the orders? Where is he? There is no answer. There will be no answer. Lieutenants get tired too, you tell yourself. Just about the time you finished a can of rations, Anderson shows up. Lanky, gray, with glasses. Anderson is about your father's age. He's well off. Runs a shoe factory back in New England. Came to do his bit, as he keeps telling you. Today, he's been doing his bit, rounding up souvenirs, and now he's laden with them. There's an armful of expensive leather. Some silverware, a Leica, some silk dresses. Took him all day, he says, to go through two warehouses, one whole one full of Polish leather. We needn't worry about them, says Anderson. I put a guard on them. Now he's ready for sleep. Since he's the boss of the detachment, you'll follow him and sleep where he says. And he doesn't want to sleep in the camp, Taggart gives you a wink. Anderson says it would be healthier to go into town and kick some big Nazi out of his warm bed and take the house over. You're glad enough for that. You'd never sleep with the noise from the next room. In the town, however, Anderson changes his mind. How do we know, he asks, that the fellow we kick out is a Nazi? Good God, we might be picky on some poor guy who's innocent of the whole thing. A roving patrol stops us in town and checks every one of us. Anderson finds out that there is a hospital with plenty of beds. That's the idea, he says. That way we put nobody out. When the jeep pulls up to the hospital entrance, you get a surprise. The sign over the door says, Inten Bung Heinschein. Maternity Hospital. Some irony in that. Maternity Hospital. Nursery rhymes. And in the middle, an SS Nazi with flint in his eyes, a Jewish nose on a boy, and a silk dress for some lady somewhere in Massachusetts. At least it ought to be quiet, says Anderson, who can't read the German sign over the door. Taggart is a joker who wouldn't let on for the world. You're too tired to care. A bouncy red-cheeked nurse lets you in. Fear is stark in her eyes. Evidently, she's been taught to expect the worst from the conquerors. Going through the door, Anderson pats her shoulder paternally. The woman leads us upstairs, and you see women peering out of doors and scurrying heavily down the halls. You hear them say, Nick so schlecht. Anderson hears it too. He knows that much German. Did you hear that? He says. What they said about us? Not so bad. Gee whiz, what did they expect? A minute later, you're in your room, which connects with the larger one with two beds where the captains will sleep. You've put the cocked 45 on the table near the bed next to the lamp and stretch out. You get up, pull the bed to face the door. Tagger sticks his head in to say goodnight. You put the light out. You dream. There's a man in your dream with a gaping skull and a crucifix in hand. He's embracing a buxom German nurse and pawing her. You yourself are lying, powerless on a cobblestone road, unable to rise to escape an enormous tank manned by soldiers you recognize as American. You can't get up. You try to yell, I'm an American too! But no one hears, and the tank come on. The weight of the world crushes out your life. You're suddenly awake. The light is on, and you have one foot out of the bed. Across the room, the horrified face of Anderson stares from the doorway and then suddenly disappears. He yells at you, for Christ's sake! You wonder what's happening. What's the matter with Anderson? Looking down at your hand, you see why he ducks so quickly. You've got the forty-five trained on the door. Anderson is lucky. He might easily have been killed. The next day, it begins all over again. They still round up SS men dressed as prisoners, shoot some of them, or beat them up, sit them down till they swallow a mouthful of the insignia ripped off their uniforms, and then shoot them. For some reason, Anderson won't go back to the hospital, but says we might find some place near the camp. So you take off alone to a group of houses just outside the gate. On the way, you pick up a stray infantryman for the extra protection of his garand. His name is McGlinchey. He's lost his helmet, but he's willing. The only difficulty you have is keeping him from shooting every German he meets. You and McGlinchey will carefully clean out one or two houses, checking for booby traps and snipers. McGlinchey wants to stop and smash every German rifle he finds. You come across a woman huddled in the kitchen of one house. McGlinchey yells his G.I. German at her, and she runs screaming out of the house. Then you notice the crucifix predominantly placed in the living room. There are several SS uniforms in the closets. Outside the house, a troop of prisoners marches by on the way to be fed. Maintain order. Order is being maintained, Colonel, you say to yourself. 
Prisoners are being kept in control, stragglers are being round up, and suspects questioned. Order is being maintained. You decide that this house will do as well as any other. Anderson and Taggart come in. With them is the woman McGlinchey scared out of the place. As usual, Taggart grins, looks at you, and winks. If God pulled hell up onto the earth, tipped it over, and let it spill over the world, Taggart would still wink. Anderson speaks to McGlinchey and says, What did you say to this lady? McGlinchey is so astonished he can't speak. Anderson turns to the woman. What did you say he called you, Frau? Now that you look at her, she's pretty good looking. Blonde, shapely, and clean. Anderson gazes kindly at her. Don't be afraid now. Tell me. He, that soldier, she whimpers. He insulted me. There is a fresh burst of tears. He told me I was a, uh, a schwein. See here, soldier, says Anderson firmly. We are over here to do a job, and name-calling makes it only harder, and we Americans are always known for our respect for womanhood, and we don't want to drag down our good name. Do you understand? Anderson turns again to the young woman who stands sniffling into a handkerchief. Don't worry, he says. Don't worry. It's all right. You are not a schwein. Nick schwein. Nick schwein. 